Good afternoon, everyone. How was your weekend, guys? All right. Did you go to the game? Yes. Yes. So, looks like finally we're playing well, right? Okay. What? Yeah. Well, let's see. Uh, today we're going to generalize Hooke's law in three dimensions. If you remember from uh, last week, we uh, you already knew, but give it just a short uh, reminder about what is the Young modulus and what is a Poisson ratio, and it's going to be very useful because what we want to do. Uh, in the short term is to use this theory of elasticity in order to predict horizontal stresses. Remember that we know how to measure pore pressure or to estimate pore pressure. We know how to calculate total vertical stress, but we don't know very well what horizontal stresses are. And the theory that we're going to see is going to allow us to tell what is the horizontal stress, or in many cases, what is equivalent to the fracture gradient, and how the fracture gradient varies with depth. That's the objective. And uh, we start here with the Young modulus. OK. The Young modulus basically tells you how stiff the rock is. And it's a proportionality between stress and strain, which is a top equation. And the other parameter is the Poisson ratio, which is very important and tells you the capacity of the rock to expand sideways when you apply a load vertically. And that's going to be very important too, because that tells you how much the rock reacts to the sides when you have a load, an overburden. And that's very important because, for example, also we're going to see that for hydraulic fracturing, how much stress you develop to the sides is going to be proportional to how much pressure you need to open up again that space laterally. All right, so here we go. I'm, I'm going to rewrite these equations, but uh, with the unknown on the left side as strain and with the known part as stress as stress on the right side. So, let me change over here. Uh, so this is solid that we're deforming in vertical direction. And basically, the equation that makes space here because we're gonna need six equations. The equation that I had before was this. Uh, the, horizon the vertical strain is going to be proportional to a vertical stress divided the Young modulus. Okay? So it's exactly the same as before. Let me let me throw some lines here to guide myself. Okay. And notice that the sign is the same. If I apply compression, it's going to be positive, and this is going to be a contraction. What about the horizontal strain? So in this case, you know, I'm apply, I apply strain in vertical direction, and I get strain in the same direction. This one is going to be. Uh, an expansion, and it's going to be negative the amount of this. But I know what that is. That is this amount. So negative <coughs> Poisson ratio times this is going to be this. And the same in the other direction. All right, so let me run this experiment again. <coughs> what these equations are telling me is that if I apply the stress in 
in direction three, and let's say this is this one. Let me find a good angle. Okay, there. I apply stress in this direction. I get a contraction in this one and an expansion in the other two. This one and towards the screen that you cannot see. Okay, we all agree with that. So that's in one direction. Let's do it now in. Uh, <coughs> yeah, it's okay. So <coughs> one, two, and three. We just did three. But this solid, uh, we're assuming that it behaves the same in all directions. So I could have the same solid and apply this one now in direction one. And in direction one, now apply a compression in direction one, and that's going to be caused by the stress sigma one one, and I should get a compression in that direction, and in the other two, an extension proportional to that compression divided the Young modulus. And if I do it now in direction two, which should be somewhere over there, it's exactly the same thing. I apply sigma two two, and I should get a compression in direction two, and an expansion in the other two. And, uh, and if I apply three stresses which are different and simultaneously in all directions, let's say in this one plus in this other one, if I add up all those effects, I'm going to get the corresponding strengths in all directions. So basically what I'm using here is just a superposition principle, saying that the result of all the independent actions is the result of adding each independent action, getting that <coughs> result, and adding all of them. So now we have three different stresses in three different directions. And I can tell you what the strains are going to be in uh, all those directions just by extending what we saw in one dimension. I'm missing three equations here, and uh, these are quite simple. We just saw the effects of normal stresses, and in order to complete the picture here, we're going to talk about the shear strains. And the shear strain is just going to be uh, proportional to, it's not going to be proportional to any of the normal stresses. And it's going to be proportional here to sigma 1, 2 divided by shear modulus. The shear strain here is going to be in one three, it's going to be proportional to shear stress one three divided the shear module. And finally the epsilon two three is going to be proportional to sigma two three divided the shear module. Okay, so these, these are our G are uh, G's. And here, this is going to be 0, 0, 0, 0. And what those zeros <coughs> means is that normal stresses <coughs> do not cause any, any shear strain. The same way, I cannot cause a shear strain in direction 1, 3 with the application of sigma 1, 2. And the same is valid for the others. And also, I could add the zeros all over here. Uh, but I'm just going to put one, OK? But also, shear stresses <coughs> cannot cause any uh, normal stress. So now, with, with these six equations and with six stresses, notice that we have sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 2, sigma 3, 3, 
sigma 1, 2, sigma 1, 3, and sigma 2, 3, uh, we can tell all the strengths. We have all the stresses and we have all the strengths. You have a question. Why is there a 2 in front of the, the, those strengths? Good question. Uh, it's just a convenience. But there is a number 2 here, and it's because of the definition of the shear modules, uh, which uh, I'm going to go ahead and define right now. The shear modulus, G, it's actually a combination of the Young modulus and the Poisson ratio. And it's equal to this. It's not an independent parameter. It's just a function of the other two. And something very important that we're going to see in linear elasticity uh, for isotropic solids is that all of these equations they just have two independent parameters. So if you measure Young modulus and you measure Poisson ratio, that's everything you need. If you measure Young modulus and you measure shear modulus, that's all you need in order to fully define uh, your solid. Let me point you now to one resource that you might find very useful. And also you might find it useful to check your homework, uh, your answers. If you go to, uh, well, let's just Google Young Modules. And you go to Young Modules in Wikipedia, and you scroll down all the way to the bottom, and you will see this table. This table is a conversion table that given any two parameters, like for example, the ones that we're seeing now are Young modulus and Poisson ratio right here. Given those two, I can tell you what the bulk modulus is, okay, what the first Lame parameter is, don't worry about that, you didn't see that. Shear modulus, the one that we just saw, and constraint modulus, which is the one that we're going to see in just a bit. But all of those are the same. They have different names. Uh, actually, in the subsurface, we never get to apply directly the Young modulus and Poisson ratio. The values that we're going to use are going to be these constraint modulus, bulk modulus, and another <coughs> modulus which is not here, which is called plane strain modulus. But it's just a combination of the other two. So again, this is going to be useful for you to check if your homework is all right. The one which is due on uh, Friday or Monday, uh, I'll decide that soon. Okay, so let's see what we do with this. Okay, writing these equations, uh, it's kind of too long and it, it takes a lot of space so it's a, a lot easier to summarize this and write it in terms of matrices and vectors so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put all these six values as a vector and I'm going to put also the stresses as a vector. I'm just going, and I'm going to say that this vector is going to be equal to something which is going to go here in the middle times the vector sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 2, sigma 3, 3, and so on. So what do you think guys is going to go now in here in this space? If I have a matrix six by one and another matrix here six by one, what do I have in the middle? A six by six matrix. I don't know if you guys are fans of geomechanics or not. I hope you like it, I hope you enjoy it. And it's very useful for you in the future. But uh, even if you don't like geomechanics, you should get very good at dealing with matrices 
because it's very useful for data analysis. Uh, for big data analysis, you need to know um, very well linear algebra, and you need to know how to deal with arrays and multiplications between arrays and sorting and all those things that we are going to see also in geomechanics. Okay, so here we're going to have a matrix six by six, and the coefficients that will go inside inside this matrix, I'm going to divide it in four, are going to be the ones that come from these equations. So, for example, for the first row, I need to solve for epsilon one one, and the coefficients are going to be this one here in the top. And here, 0, 0, 0. So that's this one, that one, this one, and the three zeros. And when I multiply this row times this column, I get exactly that equation. <coughs> I'm just writing it in another way. But it's the same thing, exactly the same thing. And the same is uh, valid for the for the other equations. Okay. This matrix is going to be also symmetric, and you see there are a bunch of zeros. And that's why it's a lot nicer to, to write the matrix form. We also save a lot of signs. And here I have one over G, zero. Be careful, this is not the six, it's a G, okay? All right. And finally, uh, we have now the same equations, uh, and it's generalized in three dimensions. What you see here is called a compliance matrix, and it's the inverse of the stiffness. So when you say something is 